<laughs> Andrew Gregory oh. is all the way, all the way here, all the way here. Came all the way from London. Andrew, hey, how are you, buddy? Hey, I'm good. Hey, good to see you, Renan. Oh, good to see you too. Andrew is a pole dancer. He's a, 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 a hair dresser. Is that the right mm-hmm. way to say it? Yeah. And uh, just a really cool dude. Like has a couple of tattoos here and there. Nothing much. Yeah, a few. Just few. A few. <laughs> So, uh, me and Andrew, we met, uh, what, like seven years ago? Yeah, I think that's about right. Around that yeah, time. Yeah. And I was uh, your teacher for a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> you were. I wasn't really sure what I was doing there, but I was... And Andrew was the one of the main guys who was, like, always very uh, positive, always, like, going for it. And, uh, yeah, I really liked your energy from yeah, the beginning. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a great time, actually. It was a great time. Yeah. yeah. I think you brought a, fresh, a breath of fresh air to the studio as well. You know, you were, like, none of the other teachers... That at all, <laughs> even if you saw, you know, it's like, <laughs> is it in a good way? Or yeah, like... yeah, no, well, in a different way. In a different, absolutely, your energy was completely different, and you know what you were teaching was very different. Yeah, um, and I kind of I miss those conditioning classes. You know, hey. they, they were great because I said like it was interesting when some some students were like, oh, a teacher or or Renard, so I don't know why I can't do a handsprings or why can't I do this. I was like, can you do five push ups or yeah, pull ups? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. it's like. Yeah. How can you think you can do such a difficult uh, move or which needs strength and you're not strong enough? Yeah. You know, and the best part was like... And when you're I, not putting the work in. Yeah, yeah. and when I started those conditioning classes, the well, which I designed uh, with all the rings mm-hmm. and all that stuff, yeah. I remember how many people uh, next day or whatever next week they would come and it's like, oh my God, I couldn't get out of bed yeah. next day because yeah. I was like so in pain. Yeah. But in the same time, I would have someone like you who would still come and say like, I'm sore as fuck, but I know that I need this. Yeah. Absolutely. Which was great. I think I, I understand that you need the, the basis of strength to do those moves. But I still have nightmares about archer push-ups. Oh, my God. <laughs> Your favorite. Um, <laughs> but the the thing is, it's interesting. If your strength and conditioning is on on the... Um, it's, it, it's well or a, um, it's strong enough, there's also less chances for injuries. People oh, exactly. don't, yeah, Definitely. people don't understand that. Then they see a cool move, especially in poor acrobatics, you can get injuries and you know that very well, so easy if you're not strong enough, you're not mm. conditioned enough, you're yeah. not warmed up enough right. and all that stuff. And um, I mean, I love it when I, so I, I teach as well now and I kind of love it when somebody arrives at the studio who has never done pole before mm. and I think they seriously think they're going to walk in yeah. and be doing some big <laughs> trick. And, you know, you do a really basic spin and they're sliding down the pole and they're just like, <laughs> why can't I hold myself on the pole? It's like, I think the those, big, that strength takes time. Yeah, and I think the biggest, work at it. the biggest one is to get used to the skin against the pole. Yeah. Especially true. when you wrap your legs around it. Yeah, yeah. But also you're using muscles that you use for, <laughs> for nothing else mm. in life. You know, mm. I'm strong in so many ways, but take me to a different sport and I am really weak. Yeah. We use a particular uh, muscles in a particular way for pole. But that's with everything. Yeah, with everything. Oh, yeah it's true. Yeah, I, you specialize I, in one thing. Yeah, if I don't yeah. do gymnastics for a while and I go do some tumbling and whatever, I next morning, okay, yeah. everything's hurting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the same thing like if, like someone like who does stunts and stuff, different disciplines like horse riding or, or uh, what is very different as well, like uh, wakeboarding, for example. Again, next morning can feel like wakeboarding when you get pulled by the rope all the time. Yeah. And you think, oh, it's not a big deal next morning. Oh, my God, I can yeah. feel it. Yeah. In fact, somebody t- recently took me to a calisthenics class. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds and, nice, uh, right? <laughs> they took me to an intermediate class because I meet the requirements for that mm. class. Holy crap. Mm. I mean, I was... Be I was in my out of my depth, so you know it's like oh my god. And the next day I was in, mm. agony. and this was not really what looked like a challenging class. Yeah. Do you remember which moves gave you the biggest trouble? Oh, muscle ups. Muscle ups. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're muscle ups. Like, yeah. And it's weird. And the muscle ups, it's it's all about technique. You know. Yeah. Exactly. And you do obviously. I, I kind of thought, well, that's sort of. Can follow technique. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Yeah. And that was interesting. 
Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of how I felt walking out of that class. <laughs> but it's, isn't it great though to realize that there's so many other things there, and and also like kind of checks your ego, you know, instead of like oh, I'm so good in doing this or that, and then all of a sudden you get something not which doesn't visually looks that hard or whatever, and you're like yeah. oh my god, you know what's going on yeah, with me? Yeah. I'm out of my depth. Yeah. Um, that's the beauty. So, so many different sports, and that's why I'm like. Um, but I will say the people in that class were so supportive. Mm. They were when I first walked in. It was like all these guys, you know, like really straight guys, yeah, and, yeah. and I felt a little bit <laughs> out of it. And then actually, they could see that I was sort of not having the easiest time. And suddenly, they were rallying around, mm. and it was that was a great experience. That yeah, was a great experience. but that's what we kind of expect expect everywhere. I mean, obviously, mm. pole pole dancers they're not very supportive. They usually put everyone down. <laughs> <laughs> you suck. only behind the back. <laughs> Exactly. In their, in That's their, so not true. That is so not face, true. Oh my god, honey, you're so good. Well done. Did you see that uh, bitch? Uh, no, that was just you and us. <laughs> No, that's the thing. I was saying in the face. You remember if I if I would, that's so true actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was probably most honest, and that's why next day no one came back to the class. <laughs> oh my god, I remember I remember some of the the classes, and and this was very vivid to me. Then when I was teaching handsprings, and it's like, so I will show that in the photo what handsprings is. It's kind of like human flag, but much like easier. And uh, as I was mentioning before, like, this, uh, I remember there's this one girl. She would, like, come every class, every week she would be there, and she still can't get the handsprings. And she she had a French accent. Like, no, why can I do uh, handstands? <laughs> and I, uh, the uh, handsprings. And I said to her, you need to be able to do at least five pull-ups. Yeah. And and then I was like, can you do five pull-ups? She's like, no. Like, here's your answer. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was fun. It was fun. Um, I think the pole, for me, it was like, I was doing pole maybe like three years, quite kind of seriously. And uh, conditioning I, actually was one of the biggest ones. And, and I also, I think I was in the best shape ever. Like a very certain type of shape was quite quite slow and big, but yeah. for Paul it was that that was the one. Yeah. Okay, so wow, what a journey you've been having. I mean, it's, you know, yeah. I see you on a on a social media once in a while. I was like, oh my god, what is this guy doing now? He's <laughs> on a balloon. Okay, cool. What's <laughs> so? Yeah, your journey with the Paul. How did it actually start? It. What was the? Um, uh, yeah, what was the first uh, kind of a? Uh, oh, I'm gonna do Paul. Well, I, ne I, I never wanted to do pole. This mm. is the weird thing. I'd been looking for some exercise that I could do. Uh, you know, my leg was injured really badly in a motorbike accident. And, you know, it was, it was not easy to do traditional exercise. And I came across this thing called anti-gravity yoga, which mm. they taught that. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, and it was great because I was off the floor. You know, you kind of supported, a little bit acrobatic, stretching, bit of strength. It was great. And I, I did that for... About two years, I think. And it was in the studio where they taught pole. Mm -hmm. um, and I was fascinated by the idea of pole, but I thought my leg would be too much of a problem. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, and then this girl arrived who was a teacher who had uh, one arm. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of thought, okay. What was her name? Debs. Debs, yeah. Deb she Roach. was amazing. Yeah, yeah. She's back in Australia now. She, yeah. she is awesome. Fantastic um, energy. She's a great inspiration to me. Oh. I hate, yeah. I hate that word inspiration but anyway <laughs> she was the one that kind of made me realize that my leg was not really an issue so yeah. then i started pole and that that was it i was obsessed immediately yeah shout out to, shout out to deb oh big, big shout out to deb roach absolutely yeah. i remember she was like she she you know i, I met her and i did some training with her as well and i remember one time she was like teaching me how to do handstands yeah Oh, absolutely. On one, yeah, one arm. Like she was saying like, oh, I use more of this technique. And how, what, what technique do you use? And it was like, for me, it was like a little bit boggled. Like, okay, what's going on here? Someone yeah. who has one arm is going to give me tips on how to do handstands. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, incredible. She, she taught me for a while and she was able to teach moves that she physically could not mm -hmm. do. But her understanding of the moves was great and she could talk you through it. Yeah, suddenly yeah. you're doing this move and it's like, oh, I didn't even see you do it you know? yeah, yeah yeah she's uh in, she's incredible and she has a studio back in australia now and nice Where, whereabouts in australia is she based oh oh shit oh, oh, shit. oh i want to say sydney i'm sure she's sydney yeah we we gonna i could be wrong assume it's sydney <laughs> <laughs> debs i'm sorry i should know that answer. <laughs> 
That's all right. Okay, and so Debs uh, was the someone who was like, okay, the word you don't want to use, inspiration. Uh, <laughs> why do you not? It's a nice word. Oh, no, What's it, wrong it, with it? It is. It is. It's, it's a great word, and I know people mean well by mm. it. But what I'd rather able-bodied people use it about disabled people, um, like, oh, you're such an inspiration. Well, mm. um, why can't you just say oh, you're really good at this? Mm, mm. You know, it's. It's quite a big thing. Almost. I know what you mean. I know yeah, what you, yeah. yeah, and especially as someone who has been dealing with that, you kind yeah. of know what kind of a, a kind of a maybe sometimes a little bit condescending feel. Exactly. Gives. Yeah. But I also understand that the people that are using that word are not understanding mm. what they mean. So I don't really take offense by it. Right. But try not to use it. Right. Let's try right, and find right. other things. You know, just just say. You're good at. That's a good. You're point. great at what you do. I think I might give it a go rather yeah, than you're inspiring me to do something. Well, not every disabled person is active like this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you know. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting one. It's like something what we need to what we deal on a daily basis. Because for me, when I moved to UK, it was a lot of I would hear like, um, "Oh, you're from Eastern Europe." It was mm -hmm. they had that. Some people like when you say where you're from, they they think, "Oh, yeah, that's pretty cool, exotic, or whatever." And some people have that, "Oh, you're this Eastern European, whatever." So. Whatever experience people have with certain words, I guess, and it gives a different meaning. Because, yeah. like, when I try to explain to other people, they're like, what are you talking about? This is totally fine. And some people, oh, okay, I get you. Yeah. 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 And, uh, um, yeah, so you start getting into Paul as well and with Debs. And then how much, uh, how long before you met me on my crazy classes and stuff? Like, that was around a year. It wasn't even that long. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. That, I was probably... I hadn't been doing pole that long, actually, I think, when mm -hmm. you came along. It's kind of that whole period, I can't quite work out my time. I was, still, I was on a lot of painkillers. Yeah. I was on a lot of, oh, shit. So this whole stretch of period where it's like my... That's why you were so happy, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's hard. I think, I mean, I was doing pole before my invitation, I think, for about a year and a half, mm -hmm. maybe two years max. So a year and a half before invitation. And yeah. so... Yeah. You were in a lot of pain class. I remember you told me like how mm. freaky, how it hurts and stuff. And I don't remember if I did say to you, so why are you just, you know, like, I do remember there was a weird feeling like, how, wh who am I to tell you that, you know, you should just, why don't you just cut it? Like, it's so weird. It's yeah. Even, yeah. I don't even want to, can't say that because. No, if, you can. It, and, and also it's, let's say if I would have that situation. Yeah. Oh, it's a tough one. In a sense, like, oh, you just why don't why don't you just get rid of the pain and I mean, and it's a weird thing to live through because thing. you know, for seventeen years, I'd had the accident seventeen years before the amputation, so I lived with those injuries for seventeen years, and through that time, mm. there was operation after operation after operation, and you know, they're constantly saying, oh, yeah, no, we can make it better, we can make it better, right. we can make it better, and. Uh, yeah, so you kind of believe them. Mm. You kind of think, oh, well, ne maybe the next operation will sort it out. Or, you know. Yeah. And then as I was becoming more active, it was becoming more painful. Um, and I was finding it more restrictive. Mm. And I finally went back to speak to them about what could be the final operation. And I was there was two options. There was one to have like one of those big cages on my leg to mm -hmm. reshape it, re-lengthen it. Um, I would never get an, a working ankle. Uh, and it just seemed like it was going to be three years out of my life where I couldn't really do anything. Mm. Um, and the other, op you know, the other option was amputation. And yeah, I sort mm. of jumped at it, really. It, mm. kind of, it was the right time. How many, how many surgeries did you do then? How many surgeries? 14. 14 surgeries. Yeah. It's almost like one surgery a year yeah. since the accident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah, it was pretty full on. Yeah. And then uh, I decided to have the amputation and went ahead with that and... I literally woke up the next morning with yeah. a big smile on my face and yeah, I haven't looked back yeah. since. I mean, yeah, there's days, of course there's days where it gets sore, mm -hmm. you know, no prosthetic is perfect. It's still plastic against skin. Yeah. You know, it can get sore, like a pair of shoes can get sore. So there's some days where it's not great. I'd say like ninety five percent of the time is absolutely. Amazing. But you can you cannot compare with the pain you had before. Oh, basically. exactly, yeah. exactly. Just, I take no painkillers for so many years. Yeah, so uh, sl kind of slowly, I, I'm I'm getting into your kind of uh, experience, and I would probably say, yeah, fuck it, like dealing with this pain on an yeah. everyday basis and yeah. all the painkillers, which are not doing any good for yeah, you and yet for your body. And, and I, the problem was, 
I was taking all those, so four different types of painkillers four Jeez. times a day. And I was still in pain. Oh I do not God. think I was not pain free. This was just allowing me to function, to work, to train, but I was not pain free. And what kind of painkillers were those? Uh, well, are you was... okay to talk about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I was on um, paracetamol and codeine, tramadol, gabapentin, and uh, diclofenac. So and any of them everything. addictive? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. How, how was it for you to get get off of this it? This is really interesting. I remember my GP calling me a couple of days after my amputation to say, "What's going on with your?" painkiller situation have they given you something to help you i was, I was absolutely fine mm. i mean i i stopped taking those painkillers on the day of the amputation uh, i had one thing that they give you after amputation to help to prevent nerve sensations mm -hmm. um i stopped that about three weeks after the amputation and that was it i never had a single withdrawal symptom which is which is really, really yeah. great yeah it was amazing because people get get addicted even after a year or two years or even oh, less period after of time months you know, yeah, yeah exactly yeah. i think because i because i was in pain and i need them and i was taking them as prescribed mm. the thing that sort of helped but you know it, yeah it was fine for me do you have any idea what kind of uh, damage actually that was doing to oh, your body i mean i i don't even want to think for about fucking it how many don't years want to think about it i know i know wow it's so interesting that, so, uh, you know, nowadays people start paying attention to that and, and noticing how big of a damage those things do to you. Mm. Back in the days, well, well doctors said, then, uh, you know, I would take them. You yeah. know, also, obviously, you don't want to feel the pain. No. I mean, I, like, weird things happen. So through that period of taking the drugs, uh, information about those drugs changes. Now, I remember mm. a few years in, suddenly there's a notice on the packaging saying that you shouldn't drive while you're on this medication <laughs> i've been driving for years beforehand on it and it's like you know so those little things yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. but yeah it's great not to be taking any painkillers now no. oh. oh and like i say if they'd work if they actually killed all of the pain yeah they're great but they don't they really don't that is that that is pretty crazy i know i didn't even thought about it again like when you would say like oh i'm taking all these painkillers it was not even one time was like, oh yeah it could be quite bad for you oh you can get addicted of it it's yeah. like and now people get more and more aware of that yeah. you know yeah. well and then that's it and i think i'm just thinking now obviously i'm not obviously but i have this idea it's about like the phantom concept the phantom leg that you felt mm. but in your case it's more about okay this leg has been hurting for so long you're like okay i got finally get rid of this um hurtful on a painful leg which is like you don't really think about fat or do you have that sensation of the phantom leg? I'm really lucky. I don't. Mm. Um, I did initially. Uh, it kind of, it wasn't pain, but it was lots of very weird sensations. Mm. And you kind of learn little tricks to help your body deal with it. In fact, what I used to do, I'd sit on the edge of my sofa. This was before I had a prosthetic. Put on a pair of long trousers and put a pair of shoes. <laughs> so I had a shoe underneath where my foot was missing. <laughs> oh, wow. And then you can visualize moving the foot and That's it would get rid of all the weird sensations. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this is, this is a thing called mirror therapy where you mm. put a mirror alongside your long leg so it mm. looks like you've got two legs and it tricks your brain into thinking the leg is that still is there. That's interesting. And that makes it easier to deal with getting rid of the pain. Yeah, yeah. But mine only lasted, I mean, for two or three months, I got weird sensations. As soon as I got my first prosthetic, they started to disappear. That mm. really helped. That's interesting. But also, mine was a planned amputation. So it's different, I think, when you have a traumatic amputation. So if I'd had it done on the night of the accident, mm. then maybe I would have had phantom pain. No. It would be also so different because you wouldn't have that years of experience of having that constant fucking yeah. pain. Yeah. It's so true. You know. But there was a risk of that, me having an amputation and still having exactly the same really? pain. Really? Absolutely. Um, wow. They did quite a lot of tests beforehand, uh, nerve conduction tests, to just check that everything was kind of working okay. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, that is always a possibility. I could have been in exactly the same situation, but without a leg, still been on all And then you would still need to do the painkillers. Exactly. Oh, yeah, fuck. Yeah. But, you know, we they did a lot of research, they did a lot of tests, yeah, and, yeah. and they thought they felt like it was going to be fine. 
Very interesting. It's a weird decision to make. Yeah, it's uh, I'm, choosing to cut off a part of your body. Very, very often when I when I have my guests or I talk to my my friends and stuff, I can like relate to things. Yeah. I have nothing to relate yeah. here with. Yeah, I know yeah. what pain means. Yeah. You know, but also I don't know what what it means to have it for that amount of time as yeah, you had, yeah, yeah. and then making that decision, you know, fuck it, and then having all these surgeries, I'm like, wow, yeah, that is crazy. You see, that's why I'm doing these podcasts because we can talk about these things in details. Yeah, you know, instead yeah. of even when I was teaching your class, I wouldn't be like, oh, so how many painkillers you take? How many surgeries? <laughs> I'll like, be like, Andrew, get your legs straight. <laughs> that's that's about it. Oh God! Yeah, it's been an interesting uh, journey getting to this point. Wow, no, that that is that is cool. And um, yeah, so then after after the surgery, uh, how long it took you to kind of um, adjust and and start getting into training back? And <laughs> so oh next day, <laughs> no, it was eleven days. Eleven, 11 days. Eleven days. I was back in the studio. In fact, there's videos on my Instagram taken eleven days after the amputation. Oh wow! Um, I've still got the stitches in. <laughs> And when I look at those videos, actually, you can see that the 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 stump is still swollen. Mm. Um, but I needed to move. I needed to move. I needed to get moving. That's what worked for me. Um, and I think the the exercise, getting back into a good routine, really helps with the yeah. healing. I mean, I had my first prosthetic six weeks after my amputation, which is really quick. Really quick. Usually, yeah. they have to wait. Yeah. Really. Um, but. I think all my movement had helped with removing the swelling and mm -hmm. no. But also I think yeah, like so much relief of I don't have to deal with the pain anymore. Oh, yeah, exactly. And also I was so excited. I know <laughs> I know it sounds weird to be excited about being an amputee. Mm. I wasn't excited about being an amputee, but I was excited about what the future held, mm. and I just wanted to get on. And also it. getting rid of that pain. Yeah. yeah that yeah. that would be yeah. the biggest And the also, biggest I quite like crutches. I was, you know, <laughs> I've, I've got a strong upper body, so I could get around really well I on love, crutches. I love you know, crutches. I was, still, I was still going out and doing clients, yeah. you know, getting on a train, carrying my equipment, uh, all of that, still working before I had a prosthetic. Doing clients, we probably we should, uh, uh, you know, Oh yeah, that's how <laughs> <laughs> Andrew is a professional hairdresser, okay? Everyone. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> uh, we should have left that one hanging, shouldn't we? Uh, yeah, we should just leave it like that. <laughs> I also wanted to talk a little bit about your upbringing and stuff. Where, where were you raised? Where did you grow up? Oh yeah, so I'm from Yorkshire originally. Okay. Um, Yorkshire uh, pudding. Uh, yeah. Hey. Um although I've kind of posh bit of Yorkshire. It's a place called Oh, you, yeah. you don't do Yorkshire puddings there? Oh yeah, no, we do, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but a uh, place called Harrogate. Okay. Uh, it's very beautiful, very wealthy area in Yorkshire. Um, a beautiful place to grow up. I had a great childhood. And you kind of hit sort of 16, 17 and so on. Especially, I'm gay, you know. It's like, mm. the, are you? I, I want, yeah. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> you see, I'm sat here with like a silver blade, you know, <laughs> so, silver crystals on my blade. It's like, it's a bit. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so See, yeah, that's so how good I'm into you. <laughs> I didn't even like. So Andrew, you're gay. <laughs> no, I got it out of you. <laughs> um, and yeah, you sort of want to mm. develop your life, you know. And it was a bit restrictive. How was it? So since since you kind of started with it, <laughs> so when uh, when did you realize? How, what age did you realize that this is? I never realized I was gay. I just never thought I was straight. You just never thought you were straight. Also, I, I didn't realize that was a thing to be. Would you yeah. think that that was a, uh, basically like you just don't fit in? You just not, you're no. not. Attracted you know, what? I to... never, I never felt like I didn't fit in. Mm. I never had those big dramas about um, discovering myself right. or feeling out of place. It's just that's how I was, mm -hmm. and it was okay. You know? Okay, and I came out to my parents. It was around. 16, I think, 15, 16. Mm -hmm. um, and they were they great were cool with it. With it. Oh, that's supportive. Awesome. You know, it's, yeah, it's been, it's been a great experience. Do you have siblings? Yeah, I've got a brother and sister, both mm -hmm. older than me. Uh, they both still live in Yorkshire and they have families. You know. So my parents have got everything, you know. Mm -mm -mm. Boy, girl and a hairdresser, you know. No. <laughs> <laughs> ah, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> 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 nice. I like that. Yeah, so then um, 16, still in Yorkshire. Yep. And then uh, when did you move? Did you move straight to London? Or? No, so I kind of um, 
Luckily, there was a big city nearby called Leeds, so that's kind of we used to mm. spend a lot of time going out in Leeds. And then I kind of started hairdressing, and within a year, I'd been offered a job down in London, so I kind of jumped at it, really. And it, it wasn't so much to come to London. It was a great job opportunity as well. Um, but it was great to come to a, mm -hmm. a, a big city. Yeah. So and with the hairdressing, then, did you go to college, or you just were self-taught? No, I, I trained at a salon in Harrogate, but they oh, okay. used to send me on some courses to a place in London, mm -hmm. and... They offered me a job. So. so hairdressing started very early. So very early you knew that hairdressing is your thing. Well, I was going to do biochemistry at university. Oh, so <laughs> yeah. hairdressing or biochemistry. Uh, yeah, That's yeah, like yeah, very yeah. close to each other. I did my A-levels and decided I would have a break before mm. I did anything. I didn't really enjoy education. So I kind of thought I'd have a break and ended up with this little job in a hairdresser. It was a really cool hairdresser, actually. Mm. And it just sort of happened really that's so interesting uh, uh. biochemistry why biochemistry well i was doing biology chemistry and physics at school so it seemed like the logical thing mm. to do you well, know at that age you don't really know what you yeah, do. Of, you kind of, of do what you yeah that's what that's what i'm kind of asking yeah, yeah. you do what you're strong at mm. i didn't really want to do anything with the physics mm. um i didn't really enjoy all the math with physics so it's much more chemistry and biology were my Mm -mm. preferred things so it just seemed and it sounds so thing. cool as well yeah it does it's like hey baby what do you I mean, do i'm pleased i <laughs> i didn't do it yeah you know i'd be a very different person today um but yeah so yeah i accidentally became a hairdresser and then with the hairdressing it was um i uh, as i understand you predominantly or only just work with women or men no no as well. no, no, you no. Do both. I, yeah 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 it's just I'm quite versatile. <laughs> I'm quite expensive. And, hey. uh, you know, guys can go for a haircut and yeah. like, you know, 15, 20 quid go to a barber's. You know, yeah. they sit, they don't have to make an appointment. I get it. I'm a lot more expensive than that. And you've got to book with me like a couple of months in advance. Yeah. So, yeah, I do have guys and they're very loyal. Uh, but it's mainly women that I do. Mm, 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 mm. And it's great. It takes me all over the world. I mean, when I first got my job in London, I think six months after I started, I was off doing shows in New York. Oh, wow. Um, and I, you know, I, I Shows? Don't, what kind of shows? I, for uh, Fashion Week. Um, and commercials, magazines. It was, you know, it was a wow. really incredible uh, period. And through that job, I met some fantastic people. Um, a lot of them still clients today. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's... it's it's a great job. People book their appointments for a whole year in advance. I know what I'm doing. I've got great income. It allows me to do other things like the poll, you know. Um, yeah, I love it. I love it. So with the hairdressing, obviously, like through the years, like fashion change, different concepts change, different approaches change. Uh, what is your, do you have like a specific style? What, to, what you're known for or how does it work usually? So you would say like you have a catalog of things you've done before and people like, oh, I want something like this or something mm -hmm. like that. How people decide what and how, this is the interesting one. When I go to hairdressers now, I, I just do this. I have some photos of my old photo, fo uh, whatever in the past, which I like the way it's done. I'm like, this, I want this. Instead of trying to explain, oh, take a little bit here, leave a little bit here, thin a <laughs> little bit out there. And in their head, they see it differently and then they just leave me with nothing in my head or too much or whatever. Yeah, yeah. How does that work with... Um, yeah, in, in, in your experience. Well, I have a lot of clients who have... I suppose people come to me when they want to achieve something that they can't do with the hair as it is. Mm. So I'm, really, I, I'm great at changing texture, colour, but also I do extensions as well. So it's like mm. if I have a lot of clients with very thin hair who want more hair and want it to look natural. Mm. Um, so that's kind of my core work is giving people hair that they really want that they can't really achieve necessarily uh -huh. elsewhere. But yeah, that thing about like you talking about going to the, the barbers. I love so I go to the bar uh, barbers. You know, I've gone sitting in the barbers like everybody else. Yeah, and I listen to how some of the clients describe to the barbers what they want. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm a hairdresser, and I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> it's like, I'm what like do you that. mean when you say, "Oh, can you just take a little bit off"? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I would like the sides short. What do you mean by short? Yeah. I mean, my idea of short and your idea of short exactly. are two completely exactly. different things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, they said number one, number two. Three. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but not everybody knows that. Yeah. yeah. 
That's an interesting one. Yeah. Um, right. So you basically uh, make people dreams come true. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, that's uh, I'm, I'm bold and uh, can I have just a lot of hair, please? <laughs> um, wig. <laughs> Oh, God, I always have a laugh when I, I think about my dad's hairstyle in the past. And in the past, that was a big deal. Remember, remember the comb-overs? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so when people bold in the in the middle and they yeah. comb over, yeah. and then the wind blows and it just lifts up yeah. and it says hi. Yeah. <laughs> and and now everyone is going to Turkey, right? Yeah. Yeah, to, to put the uh, hair pla- yeah, implants. Yeah, I mean, hair transplants are yeah. amazing. As long as, here's my message for the day, don't start them too early because you oh, will really? carry on losing the hair around your hair transplant. Oh. So wait till it kind of settles before you have your hair About transplant. About when you're like 75, 80. Oh, right, no, no. <laughs> but, you know, you kind of give it a chance, see where it's going before you have your first hair transplant. How, how does it work? So when people start balding, then it's kind of like very progressive, very quick. So they... It's, well, it's different for everybody. Yeah, that's what everybody. I was thinking. Yeah, so yeah, if yeah. someone balds... Well, you usually have, you know, you can usually get an idea of whether you're going to go bald all over or if mm. it's just an area, if it's thinning, you know, you kind of get an idea, but it's mm. just don't rush to have that first hair transplant. Oh, wow. Um, like the message. There's only so many you can have. <laughs> there's only so many, you can, you know, most people can have like four or five hair transplants throughout yeah. their lives. And they usually take from your back, your back Yeah, hair so it's always thick it... around the back and sides. No, 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 on the back. No, no, on the back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen your back for a while. <laughs> <laughs> some people have very hairy backs yeah it's true yeah, and then if you don't have hair on your back then there's some other area <laughs> this is what, in my head I would be thinking yeah. about it. I, mean, I know people that have had hair transplants into the eyebrows oh which, absolutely it's kind wow. of like well why not it still works hair transplants are really successful mm. you know it's literally pushing the hair into an open you know a, a, a cut and that follicle will take right it's so, just like just like gardening yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it really is. It really <laughs> is. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and like, how is the uh, for you the 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 hairstyling? Is it how does it have like moments where it's kind of still stagnant, nothing really develops, and then all of a sudden something happens? And what are those reasons? Because of some like uh, celebrities are changing something, and then people like um, uh, there was this craze about everyone wanted had hair like Rachel from Friends. Like, oh, I want to. I lived that. I uh, lived through that. <laughs> exactly. So, what do they do now? Like, I want like Joe Rogan, bold, or like, wh- what are the trends? It's who's... very rare that those things come along. Really? Anymore. Yeah. I think the last sort of big trends were like when Gaga was kind of first on the scene. And she right. was really out there. She had really cool wigs, really cool hairstyles. So, people would be inspired by that. Um, but I think those, those big looks just don't happen mm. anymore. You know? Um, I'm also very much outside of the hairdressing industry. Um, I do my clients and that's it. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I'm not really connected to the industry itself. Right, so you don't do shows anymore as no, much as that? No, I just do my private clients. Just your yeah. private clients? Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's exactly. cool. Is it because the shows are too hectic and being away? They're really, and like, yeah, they're yeah. really hectic. In fact, the last one I did at London Fashion Week was for like probably the biggest designer mm. I could possibly got to i never got paid for it and i just kind of thought all the work that had gone into it and they're saying oh well it looks good on your cv well <coughs> i'm doing the biggest job that i could possibly do it and why what I, yeah you yeah. didn't get paid yeah um so i kind of then started focusing on my clients because that's mm. you know that's my bread and butter money yeah 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 and uh how often do you see someone and you're like, oh, my God, girl, this is so bad. <laughs> oh, you see, that doesn't happen because everybody pre-books their appointments. No, 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 oh. no, no, no. When you oh, see it on the street. Just in, on the oh, street no. and, uh... I don't look at people's hair. They're not paying me. I'm not interested. <laughs> I am not. I don't care. Girl, I'm not wasting care. my time with this shit. And also, it, you know, just because I don't like something yeah, doesn't mean to say that person could feel amazing with mm, that hair and mm. that's what it's about it's that's about how about. you feel about something mm. um i don't like it when people jump in, oh, it's a bit dated or whatever well that person feels great so yeah that's a really good point that's a really good point like whatever however you feel yeah and uh but then unfortunately then how many of us how many people are following the trends 
Like, yeah, it even doesn't look at them very well, and that's so, about so many things. Yeah, don't assume that because you're following a trend that it's going to look good on you. Yeah, you know, it's, it is about how you feel. It's pretty if, sad. If you feel good, that's the most important thing. Yeah, it's pretty and don't sad. let anybody tell you any different. You know? Yeah, because like uh, when I just moved to UK, I remember like I noticed people from Essex. You know, like right. got, guys would get the sleeve tattoos, get their tight trousers, uh, and and get like uh, really really fake tan and stuff. And girls have this crazy no makeup. socks, loafers. Yeah, 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 yeah. no socks, loafers. And I was like. What is going on here? Yeah. And they're like, oh, this is how we do. Yeah. <laughs> this is how yeah. the cool people. I was like, what? Yeah. Where's your original take take on it? But to them, yeah, that's it. And that, that makes them feel good because exactly, they feel like they're exactly, part of a tribe. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, tribes. It's huge, kind of what it's about. Huge thing about yeah. tribes. Yeah. They feel that of belonging and stuff. And mm. and uh, I think I'm just. I, about myself and I think people who I'm surrounded with as well like it's mainly like I feel comfortable I don't give two fucks about what other people think yeah. you know it's just yeah. like this is I feel that suits me and um, yeah recently I talked to someone about this I was like oh so what kind of your style my style as long as I feel comfy I'm talk, yeah. walking around with flip flops <laughs> all day long I don't care <laughs> yeah that's about it um, okay let's have a little break Bruno's Podcast Okay, and we are back. Had a little break. I I was the only one who did the stretches. How is your stretches? Do you wake up in the morning? Do you have a routine of stretches and oh, stuff? Man. I'm lucky if I can even stand up straight when I wake up in the morning. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. You see, this is the thing what I start doing. No matter what, every morning I start with cold shower and do my basic stretches. And right. It doesn't matter if I train that day, don't train, because it used to be this, I'm like... Rolling out of bed, oh, I'm going to train in about two hours, so I'm just going to have a coffee or whatever. But now, it just you create that. It's just like you brush your teeth. Oh, yeah, no, I feels good. I get up, go to the kitchen, have like five coffees. Then oh, I'll wow. think about doing something. But honestly, my body every morning is so sore. Really? I mean, how, old you, how old are you now? I'm almost 40. Okay. Yeah, we're about, uh, what, 30 years difference? <laughs> Not half. Yeah, I'm about to turn 52. And it's like hey. your body really... You really start to feel it. <laughs> but I think you start feeling it. Well, obviously, I can't, can't uh, say about your situation. And your, your case is very different and unique. And also so many years of painkillers and like all those things can leave mm. different, you know, things. But um, how is your recovery? Do you do any cold baths? Do you do saunas? You should no. do those things. No, but I, it's time. I mean, I'd love to. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, like, but that's your health. I get up, I work, I train, I go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. And it's difficult. I don't know how it's like where you live. Do you have any gyms around with the saunas and cold baths? And all oh, that? absolutely. Yeah? I mean, I live right in Zone One in London. It's like I've got hundreds of gyms around. Me. Yeah. Um, but it's like. You know, but that's. I, I, I would definitely to suggest you to look into like, especially recovery, the saunas and cold baths. That's yeah. that's something. Even in the morning, if you just wake up with a cold shower, that's already makes a huge difference. Yeah. I've got a list of. <laughs> I just look at your face. You like, possibly yeah. do, and it's like. <laughs> No, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Like even this morning, no, it's bad. I know. I yeah. I absolutely agree with you, but like, yeah, whatever. And it's and it's uh, physically one thing, but mentally, like especially a cold yeah. bath. Like this yeah. morning before I came to set up the studio with everything, I went for a really quick one, like half an hour, just a swim and cold bath, and it just kind of almost like like turns the but the button on is turned on now. Yeah. I'm like yeah. awesome. So. Just, you know, in the future, I get it. think I get about it. I get it. Cool. Okay. So, poll stuff. Let's go back to the poll stuff uh, and the journey. And then it's been crazy. Um, so, a year and a half before you did the snip or the, that's it. Oh. Got rid of your f uh, left foot. Yeah. <laughs> so I still find it quite interesting <laughs> talking about it. And then you got back to training and then... Um, so how that all kind of continued? So you just continued training, then you got noticed, or someone invited for you for your gig, or you well, were competing. First of all, I kind of when I had the amputation, I I knew about this kind of world para pole com right. competition with IPSF, which is worldwide um, pole championship. It's massive. It's huge, um, and I kind of decided that I would enter the the para pole competition. Mm -hmm. I did, and I won, and it was kind of great. And then. <laughs> <laughs> I did that for a second year as well, but I kind of realized quite quickly that I also wanted to compete against able-bodied polars. I just wanted to be in a competition with everybody else. Mm -mm -mm. Um, and IPSF is pole sport, so it's kind of more, 
uh, technical. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more about um, requirements, compulsory moves, bonus points. Everything has to be at the right angle to the judges. It, it takes away the kind of artistic freedom of it. Mm. Um, so I decided then I was also going to do uh, regular pole competitions. Um, and my first one was a competition called Pole Theatre, which I entered and I won, which was, I'm, I won the amateur one then. Mm -hmm. I've just recently won the pro one as well. Um, and that's against uh, Able Body Polos. Um, yeah, what is, what is. is this one video? So this is uh, the, f uh, hang on a second, which one is that? That is, oh yeah, that's the first one. So that's Paul Theatre Amateur um, in the drama category. So it's tell, you have to tell a story. Mm -hmm. So I kind of decided I would do something specific to me, which is waking up after the amputation um, and going through to being given my first prosthetic. Um, yeah, but I, I saw it, I was like, that's a very it's, strong... It's kind of weird. I kind of... Um, hmm. It's quite weird to be watching this, actually. Um, How long ago this was now? That was 2019. Four years ago. 19. Yeah, 19. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I still love this routine. I mean, I can pick holes in it, but actually, as a piece, it's incredible. I remember, actually, there's a moment where I do a backflip and I land, you know, I'm doing a backflip off the pole onto one foot. And the audience was just quiet and I was like, I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> Didn't that work? And then I kind of like finish a piece and I'm stood at the front of the stage and the music ends and it's silent. And I was like, what the hell? And uh, it was because people were really emotional. It really got to people, um, which obviously that's what I wanted. Mm. I didn't realize it was going to have quite the effect that it did. Mm. Um, and, oh, uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a great piece. It's a great piece. And as you said, like to tell the story that, um, yeah. I was going to see if, how is this split? I see, I see, uh, I thought I was going to be able to pick more holes in this. I haven't watched this for a long time. And for oh, me. For, oh, oh, God, I love that bit. Uh, Man. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was emotional for people watching it, but also I had to walk off stage really quickly afterwards. So I was absolutely... Knackered. Uh, yeah. No, not knackered. Emotionally. I mean, I was oh. crying. I was absolutely crying. It was such a big um, a big moment for me. Um, and then to win it was just uh, incredible. God, that was good as well. Mm. For me, it's this still... Is <laughs> this is better than I remember it. You know, you can, like, when you look back at yeah. stuff... Um, my legs were quite, my legs it's were difficult quite. for me to get used to that I can't see the other leg because yeah. I remember as uh, when I was uh, coaching you and when we were uh, together in the studio, I remember you with both. And uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, that flip wasn't great, actually. I did touch that. Yeah. Anyway, I can pick holes in things. But anyway, yeah. this is still, it's still a great piece. It still stands up to um, It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And so this was the first kind of a big competition since uh, amputation or uh, no it's the first competition against able bodied polos gotcha ipsf is huge um but that was just parapol so mm -hmm. that's kind of like against disabled polos um so this was the first uh regular competition right right right, right. so it was very this was actually weirdly more important to me than than yeah. the, the parapol one i want to i want to be able to share a stage with everybody and not be, um not be considered disabled i just want to be a good pole yeah, yeah good yeah, pole yeah, performer yeah. you know that's what it's about um and to be able to to compete alongside those people is uh is a great thing mm -hmm. you know? and for you again like this is the pole has been passion and when do you when do you think it it became your passion when do you realize okay this is my thing was it before amputation? Was it after amputation? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it was that first day that I tried pole. Mm. It literally just clicked. Oh, yeah, I I did five hours that day. I just booked another class, another class. I left with blisters on my hands. Oh god! And I just absolutely loved it. I can't tell you what it is I love about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It just got its hooks into me. I love well. 
I love the acrobatic element of it. I love the artistic side of it. I love the sport side of it. I love the the exotic side. Mm. We don't use that word anymore. We use I use you know the the stripper side of it. There's so many different angles with it, mm. um, and there's a sense of community as well. Um, uh, it's it really got its hooks in. It takes me yeah. back as well because um, I remember when I was working still for Dream Boys. Yeah. That's where I did my show, and mm. but that was the show I created. It was like probably the best show. I, w I would be performing different events and stuff, but that setup was so perfect. Like and like my storyline worked and everything worked. Mm. And uh, um, it's so funny whenever I would tell to people like, "Oh, dude, Paul," and then, "Oh, you stripper, Paul," yeah. you know. Yeah. And then that's the a kind of a stigma which uh, we kind of already. I think it's much, much way better than it used to be like five years ago, ten years ago. It is, but it's definitely still there. It's I still mean, there. I kind of like I feel really weird when I tell people I do mm. poll because I know what they're thinking. Yeah. Um, in fact, one of my neighbours recently, I saw them in the street and they're like, oh, we found out your secret. I was like, what secret? Like, oh, <laughs> Which one? The, the poll. Yeah, I was worried. I was really, I mean, I was seriously worried. These people live next door to me. Um, and they're like, oh, you do poll? And it's like, that's not a secret. And, you know, it's kind of, yeah. I think in their heads, they had that, that attitude. So funny, um, but that just shows straight away like how close-minded and I wouldn't say simple, but yeah, in a way, it's it's actually interesting to talk about this because someone who has been doing this and who understand ins and outs and what is it actually about, mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to send all that information in someone's head. So it's just true. like when someone says like golf, oh golf, I really enjoy golf, and I in my head, someone who has been doing athletics and sports since I'm a little kid, I think golf is bullshit. It's like there's not nothing to it. It's you know for old people whatever. And then I go to a range, and the first thing I did, I was like. I tore a muscle in my stomach <laughs> because like it takes you in knowledge and technique and there's so many little things. And I'm like, I have such a totally different respect towards, uh, towards the, uh, golf. Uh, but the same thing about pole when I, I was like, Oh girls is, and then wrap my legs around a pole and it slides and it feels like it tears your skin <laughs> yeah, out. So then yeah, you yeah. get a different respect. Absolutely. It's basically, it's when people haven't tried something, they honestly, they should not be having any opinion about things. Yeah. Yeah. They would say like maybe oh that looks looks beautiful whatever but I don't know so that's why you should not have your opinion about it almost like <laughs> well so I find it weird that you so you have like parallel bars which you know things that people hang off and they do all that crazy stuff on you take that same piece of equipment and turn it that way yeah and people have a completely different attitude towards it funny enough about three weeks ago four weeks ago there was a guy sitting here in that seat he's a world champion in doing uh, bar stuff right and do the flips around yeah. everything yeah. Uh, Jay Chris you know. And uh, I'm just just so happy that I have different kind of representatives yeah. of different pole stuff. Yeah. Um, and I don't have a problem, you know, I... No, no, no. Absolutely, as far as, like, strippers, um, you know, where kind of modern pole developed. Um, I love that that's part of it. And I love that people still have that awareness. But mm. now it's nice. That I wish people would understand it's a much broader spectrum yeah, now. Yeah, There's yeah, so yeah. many different angles to it. You know, I mean, this... Whole theatre piece is so far removed mm. from um, the clubs, mm. but they're intrinsically tied together. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, just the, even to imagine that I would go there and start doing one dollar bills doesn't yeah. make any. No, like, what no, are you talking about? No, this no, is no. artistic. It's although performance, if you feel it's like physical. It, doing one dollar, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it any time. <laughs> yeah, no problem with that. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> And someone who worked in the in the club in the gay clubs as a go-go mm. dancer, I used to mm. get tips in my undies all the yeah. time. So I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> Back in the days, um, yeah, it's it's very interesting how human perspective, uh, how it works and how it develops. And the same thing like when I do used to work for Dream Boys when I was doing stripping. So people would be, "Oh, you're a stripper. You don't even understand. We have to practice, train, get our bodies. We have to yeah, do the rehearsals, do all." We don't even go fully naked. We just go to the uh, shorts or whatever. No one cares because they decided to put you in that box. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's who you are. Yeah, but also, like, that's, I mean, does it matter? Yeah, it, that's true. Exactly. But yeah, absolutely. It's, it's so much more than yeah taking your clothes off. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's the same, you know, for any stripper. Oh my God, the amount of work that it takes to get to that point mm -mm. where you're taking your clothes off, you know, people don't see that. Mm. 
But yeah, you know, Magic Mike helped us change that a little bit, yeah. I guess. True, true. <laughs> um, have you ever done, actually, a, a stripping routine? No. Never? No. Yeah, you should have one. No, I mean, I kind of, <laughs> you know, it's like, I think you've got to have a certain amount of confidence in your mm. body to do that. And it's like, I mean, my body's fine. Yeah. But it's like, nobody really needs to see it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I say that, look, I'm performing in a tiny pair of shorts. You know, I, I am body confident but i i'm not in a kind oh, no, of but sec i don't feel I, you know you've got to feel yeah, yeah. A, a certain amount of sex but what i would mean do. what i mean it's you wouldn't go fully full monty yeah. you would Although be to gone, your trunks I, weirdly but, but i have that's gone what I'm fully saying. naked really I mean, yeah so i did this uh i was weirdly in the vna for six months totally naked which is kind of weird um, what, what does the vna means uh it's a museum in London, Victoria and Albert Museum. Okay. Yeah, so I did this um, project called Arrested Movement. Oh, God, I've got, I need to check that I've got that name right. Arrested Movement? Yeah, and there was this project about male body positivity. And oh, okay. I was asked to take part in it shortly after the amputation. And it was, first of all, it was images, and then um, they liked the way they moved, so they, wanted to, they brought me back to do um, some filming as well. And then that became part of a film that went into um, an exhibition in the V&A. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the first time actually I'd been completely naked in front of a camera. It doesn't bother me mm. in any shape or form. Um, but I wouldn't want to do it every day. You know? Yeah. I just recently watched, there's a um, friend of mine <laughs> showed me in Germany, there was this uh, thing like similar like to B Big Brother, mm. but everyone's naked. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I was, but it, the funniest thing, first 10, 20 minutes felt weird. Yeah. And then it was like, okay. You get used to it. Very yeah, you yeah, get yeah, used yeah. to it. It's just Once like, you've kind of like looked somebody up and down, you've got it over with. It's over. It's it? just, but it's also that again. It's one of those like uh, a stigmas, not stigmas, but this how we conditioned what is considered to be acceptable, not acceptable. When I lived in Canada in Vancouver, I used to go to this place called the Rec Beach, which is a nude beach. Okay. And then it's funny they divide in like two halves. One is straight half, another one is gay half. Right. Like I was hanging out with my gay friends, so I wasn't a gay half. And uh, I I never felt so much love in my life. Yeah. In a sense, yeah. like everyone was checking out and like. Yeah. Trying yeah. to have a conversation yeah. with you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and it, it, again, first, like, whatever, half an hour felt weird, but then yeah. you're like, eh, yeah, just yeah. naked it's so bodies, true. naked bodies. It's so body. true. I mean, it's a shame we have those hang-ups yeah. about being naked, but, you know, it is what it is. Society. Yeah. But there are communities who, you know, go go full Monty all the time. Oh. Just need to <laughs> go find one of those. <laughs> Okay, we kind of sidetracked here. So, yeah. um, sorry, I'm really good at that. Oh no, <laughs> it's perfect. Um, so we got, went uh, with that to figure out the not figure out, but like kind of uh, break it down a little bit the journey. Uh, so since the amputation till now, how many years has it been now? It's been uh, it'll, in February. It'll be six years. Uh, February so will be it's six like years. Five and a half years. Yeah. And then, um, so since then, the, the biggest things what I what I saw what I noticed was that. It was the Jubilee uh, the, where you were <laughs> hanged on that balloon. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. I how, of, did that, how did that came across? Where did that... Um... So I, I've been really lucky. Everything that I do has come via um, Instagram. Um, and I got this message one day asking if I would be interested in taking part in the Queen's Jubilee. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was like, yes. Yeah. I, mean, I didn't really ask even what it was. And then... Finally, we got to have some meetings about it, and they were like, "Yeah, we want you to hang off this balloon, you know, mm -hmm. thirty feet up in the air." How um, did that? How, what was your first reaction when you when you heard the idea? Oh like, man, I was so excited. I was so excited. And then I mean, we had no concerns. Like, it's like no. high up there. It's like could be scary. Like, no, I mean, I didn't really know how high I was going to go. And, and you're okay with the heights, right? So you yeah, know, yeah, I yeah. am absolutely. But for this. Um, so in this thing called pirouette harness, so the pirouette harness allows you to rotate over in one direction, but also spin in the opposite yeah, direction. Yeah, so yeah. you can move in all directions. For stance, we have those as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So Well, the whole concept with this was that they wanted somebody, normally on these balloons, they have like, you know, beautiful, small girls. Yeah, okay. and you are six feet. Six foot three. Um, <laughs> and the harnesses are, are made and measured for them. Yeah. So, 
we could practice in the harnesses beforehand, but I never actually got onto the balloon. So a lot of it was getting used to the harness. They were very tight because obviously they're not made specifically. Yeah. Right. Um, and in fact, we used to rig it in the studio where you used to do your rings class. So oh, you know right. that it's not a lot of height. It's literally yeah, like yeah, feet yeah. off the ground. Uh, so it took about six weeks to build up tolerance to the harness um, oh. because it kind of was, we were getting a lot of bruises, mainly because of the fit. Um, and then the only time we went on the balloon was about two hours before this. <laughs> so the balloon got filled, we got clipped onto it, it took it up a bit, had a go just to get the feeling of it because it feels very different when you're on yeah. the balloon. Itself. Uh, but still, it didn't go to full height. And I remember getting to this point, you know, the roundabout outside Buckingham Palace, which is the first time they can really let you go because there's no trees. And the sensation, oh. <laughs> like I, was, I was going up and up and it was like, but it was, yeah, it was incredible. It was, it was an incredible day. Because the only incredible. thing I can think of is what would happen if they let you go? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's filled with helium. You're going to go floating off. Uh, there is an emergency release, so if you pull this oh, okay. thing, it will gradually let gradually. It run. Yeah, it, <laughs> you will descend. It lets the helium out. Yeah. So there's safety precautions, um, and it's so cool, like such a cool concept. Yeah, and, and they got uh, a, lot of, a lot of attention because of this as well. Yeah, um, and then the, did the queen? Did, did you wave the queen when, <laughs> when she was? Yeah, there? so she was. Um, we only just found out that she was actually there. Yeah. Shortly before going on the balloon, so that was nice. But she wasn't in the stands; she was in Buckingham Palace itself. Oh, uh, right. But the royals were there in the the stand, and um, the atmosphere was incredible. Because uh, how long after this she, did she die? Um, so this was June or July, and I think she died in October. Um, I mean, leading up to it, mm. we all had our fingers crossed that you know she was going to be okay because mm. obviously she was in decline. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even though nothing was really being said. Um, so it was great that the event actually happened. Um, and yeah, it was a great experience. A and great then experience. the movement wise, and also how, like how long did you actually uh, stay on that balloon? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. 20 minutes is about your limit in one of those harnesses. Right. Um, and then you, that uh, minute 18, 19, you could like, okay, this is like hurt. Yeah. In tired. fact, as we were coming out of the roundabout, I could feel... Uh, it cutting into one of my oh, no. hip bones and it was like every time I went upside down it was like Ugh. and you know you carry of course you carry yeah, yeah, yeah. Never noticed, but um, I had a, a numb patch that lasted for quite a few months afterwards wow. but it was worth everything yeah, it was yeah, worth yeah. everything because yeah. that adrenaline and that yeah. before, it totally yeah. killed that stuff yeah oh that is cool I mean so I was like 50 40 50 when I did this 49 you know, you don't expect this stuff to happen to you. Yeah. You know, it's like a whole new period of my life started yeah. at that age. Um, and I didn't think, I thought this would be the only really big gig. Although I, actually I did something else for Bijou, this uh, the circus company that organizes called Bijou. Mm -hmm. I did another event for them, which was on top of a, a dam in... Uh, Is that your Instagram somewhere? Um, yeah, there's a thing in there somewhere. It's me and a girl on a Chinese pole on top of a dam. You'll have to go down quite a way. Oh, there it is. So, it's yeah, this one, yeah. yeah, I, rem yeah. I remember this one, yeah. So, this, this is one. actually on top of a dam on a reservoir. Originally, we were going to be performing on harnesses on the side of the dam, mm -hmm. uh, but at the last minute, the landowners wouldn't let us. So, we did Chinese pole. And this is part, this was part of a film about access to public areas. Mm. Um, and it was a, a beautiful piece, actually. It was beautiful. It was much more than just us being on the pole. There's a, the, you know, there's a whole section to it. And then I didn't really think I could top the Jubilee. Mm. It was like, I didn't think anything else would come to that level. Yeah. I was doing loads of other performances, like clubs, events, um, that little footage with the face piece on, that's from another performance. Uh, so I was doing a lot of performing, um, which is on pole, which is great. Yeah. And then um, I got this email from the BBC asking if I would be interested in being part of the Eurovision, which, like, my, I literally stopped breathing when I read oh. that. And I sort of didn't believe it would actually happen, to be honest. Um, and it turned out to... I wasn't going to be doing pole. It was part of a stage performance with uh, Sam Ryder, mm. who was 
a guest performer at Eurovision in Liverpool. Um, and it happened. You know, it was it was amazing to be on stage with so many other amputees and people with disabilities who were also living really powerful lives in the same mm. way that I am. Um, it's really nice to be to meet disabled people who are doing the same thing as you um, and who, you know, are, I don't know, leading the way almost. Mm. Uh, and it was a great experience. You're sort of wrapped up in this bubble for a couple of weeks, rehearsals, a lot of rehearsals. Uh, the show itself you do a few times, with different audiences. It's just the, only, the third one is the one that's actually recorded mm -hmm. and has the live vote. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it was a great experience. It was, I mean, walking out on that stage, just incredible, <laughs> absolutely incredible. Right. And do you remember the so the people who you were there with? Uh, what kind of other, what kind of disciplines they were representing? What kind of sports or activities? Oh, yeah, there was dancers. There was um, there's a guy who jumps out of planes. Uh, there's a break dancer. Um, there's acrobat. You know, there was kind of, a bit That's of awesome. everything there. Uh, but also people who aren't necessarily doing sport mm. but are just living a very visible mm -hmm. life with their disability mm. you know doing great things how is it to be a coach mm -hmm. yeah you've been I teaching, love teaching. How long? uh i was trying to work this out i think it's like two or three years mm. um i only teach one day a week um because i prefer to keep my training up. Mm -hmm. excuse me uh but yeah, I I love teaching. Um, I kind of thought when I first started that maybe people wouldn't want to come to a class with the, <laughs> the disabled guy. Um, but it works well. Um, yeah. And do you um, notice or recognize someone's um, keenness and someone's like a, a, a spark in a in the eyes the way you had it when you started oh, yeah. doing pole? Yeah. Isn't yeah. that great yeah. too? It's not that common. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people do it for a great way to exercise, the social aspect of it. Um, it's kind of fun, but not everybody wants to go and compete and perform. Mm. But when you see that in somebody, it's such a great feeling to be mm. able to push them, push them, push them. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's great when those people come along. But it's not for everybody, you know. Yeah. You've got to remember within a class of 12 people, you might only have one person who actually wants to go on to do more. Um, for a lot of people, it's just a, a fun thing to do. Mm. You know? What is the main reason why pe why people uh, do pole? Like, I'm guessing the predominantly it's female. How is it now in the yeah. studios? Like, do we have still? Because I remember when I was teaching, we would have boys here and there, mm. but very rarely. Yeah. Um, and some of the boys, I, I remember you were actually the. I think you were the only one who was like kind of. I'm just a dude doing my thing, coming my sneakers, whatever. <laughs> but then we would have other guys, like they go full on stilettos and it has to be very flamboyant and yeah. it has to be this and like, oh. you know, everyone goes with what works for them. Yeah. Uh, how is it now? Like uh, the, uh, is it getting more popular for boys? It's definitely getting more popular yeah. for boys. And there's still, you know, a lot of guys do it in heels. They want to do the kind of like more exotic side. <laughs> It's so exotic. It's like, it explains it. I think it explains it really well. But in mm. this country, we've kind of drawn back using the word exotic. Um, mm. So I'm not really sure what word to use there. Um, but yeah, there's also the, the guys that are coming through that are doing it much more from the sport angle mm. um, are definitely on the increase. It was interesting as me for me as well to see like some uh, male performers are like in it's like a, a circus discipline with a crazy acrobatics like yeah. that you know you can look at that pers uh, the way on the pole and then at the same time it could be very like a dancey and like very again like we go back to strippy kind of concept of that but it's how you express yourself how you enjoy it yourself you know absolutely there's so many and I do love to see yeah. what I really love is to see. A guy in a pair of heels doing the acrobatic stuff. Mm, mm, mm. That, to me, visually, I think is absolutely yeah. amazing. You're doing flips off the pole onto the floor in a pair of nine-inch stilettos. It's yeah. like, man, you got my attention. It is. It's just so, so weird, weird now. Like, I, for example, I've been uh, focusing a lot on uh, figure skating now. So mm. I'm learning different, like, spins and yeah. twists. Yeah. And when we 
someone says figure skating again like very similar like uh, someone says pole dancing they would like have this certain kind of a visual um you know oh this you know a girl and, you know, and that's very, what they this think. and that and then now <laughs> when i'm doing and i, I want to try to learn uh doing backflip yeah. on the ice skates yeah, which yeah, is yeah. uh you know the I think one of the coolest and, and, and you need some balls to do that because, yeah. you know, if you smack yourself on ice, it's a different story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it is kind of a little bit, ice skates do a little bit represent stilettos in a sense, yeah, like absolutely. when you do certain moves and stuff. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it, it's a different and, and it's a challenging. And mm. uh, if people, it's like, they, oh, yeah, you know, this is what they do. I, I'm going to do my football and my rugby and whatever. It's yeah. like, yeah, but how about exploring different uh, movements and different concepts? Yeah. And ice skating also, like figure skating, really works for me similar to with the pole. With the pole, because it's a music, it's a dance, it's a performance. Yeah. You yeah. go on a beat, you do yeah. a certain move, you, you land a certain beat. If you go like a, a land a certain move in, a, in, a, in that beat, it's just like this kind of a crazy satisfaction and in uh, ice skating, it's very similar. So that's why I kind of, I love still, I listen to my music in my ears, uh, like uh, headphones, and I do those tricks. It's really cool. Yeah, um, yeah backflips. I mean, I remember I used to be so frightened doing any kind of flip off the pole. Because yeah. I only used to pole without my prosthetic. I now do some pole with it on, some pole with it off. So I was always going to be landing on one foot, and it was used to scare mm. the crap out of me. Now I teach workshops for flips mm. i absolutely love doing flips really amazing do you remember the breaking point what happened why did you um... uh, yeah in fact there's actually a video on my instagram of the first time um i did a flip yeah of course i'm a bit dorky afterwards boom uh... i mean looking at it now it's a terrible landing but it's like you <laughs> no, know, it was, <laughs> that that was a really big moment for me um, it's all about that first time. Man. It really is. It's awesome. It really is. That seems like a lifetime ago. And then now you do them, and in the, in the, you're like, oh, what, what, what was I afraid of? Yeah, or exactly. what was like? I mean, I still that? have a, I still have a, res a healthy respect because yeah. I'm landing on one foot, and I don't want to damage that foot. If I damage yeah. that foot, I am not walking. Yeah. Um, so I still have a healthy respect for them, and make sure my technique is solid. Um, but yeah, I do, I do a lot of flips now. So when you do this kind of stuff, for example, can you use prosthetic and land on both feet? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. So it depends really on what I'm performing. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, I prefer if I'm doing flips to wear the prosthetic. Yeah, but yeah. sometimes I need that knee to grip to set a move up. Um, right, because if you have a prosthetic on, you can't... I can't grip. Oh, you yeah, can't yeah, grip. It just can't, there's no grip behind here. And also it can break the seal right. that holds the leg on it, force the leg off. Right. Um, That's so very interesting. You see, like, someone who doesn't do pole, like, they wouldn't understand. Like, why wouldn't yeah. you use the prosthetic the whole time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because I need that specific yeah. area to, to get a grip. Oh. In fact, I've got a competition coming up next week where I am wearing a prosthetic for the whole routine, which oh. is the first time I've ever done that. Um, and it's great, but the back of this knee, <laughs> of my good knee, is so sore because mm. for five minutes, I'm only using one leg on the pole. Mm. And it's like, it gets sore, it rubs, you know, normally you'd swap from side to side yeah, through right, a routine, right, right. everything is on one side. Uh, and it looks great, but it's, uh, it definitely makes it. Do you think yeah. in the future there would be uh, possible or is, it, is there like some kind of ideas of creating a prosthetic where you can put like a silicon or something in the back so you can actually use it for grips as well? Well, I actually did uh, create a leg with um, the Alternative Limb Project mm -hmm. who um, she's... It, Sophie's the most amazing designer. She works with Vittorio Modesta and make that beautiful black spike leg. I'm sure mm. you'll have seen it anyway. So we kind of created this um, leg that's kind of an art piece, but also was functional for pole. So we kind of like cut the back out. It attaches differently. Um, but it still has too many limitations in other ways. It's like, it's great for on the pole, but I can't really walk properly in it. Mm. So when you remove one thing, it causes problems. Right, 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 right. So I just prefer, you know, I can take my prosthetic off really quickly. So now I kind of usually will do a mixture in a routine of having the leg on, taking it off, putting mm. it back on again. Mm. Um, so play around, being able to do both with it, really. Mm. <laughs> I'm just imagining if you get in a fight or something, 
<laughs> oh, I've thought that. Listen, I have thought about uh, also, whipping like, that leg off and whacking hold somebody my over leg, the head. I'm gonna <laughs> beat this fucker up, <laughs> or just take it off, and there's like some kind of a something inside. You see, this is. Well, where I mean, I, they're quite a good weapon on their own. Yeah, I mean, this, you know, is, this is this is where my off, head I've got goes. A handle to hold, as though. a stunt performer, as a, like you know, in a movie, there's like pop, yeah. bam, 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 Absolutely. smack, smack, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's why you should uh, hide your drugs. Yeah. <laughs> pouch of cocaine just stuck in there <laughs> extra scissors <laughs> yeah. Yeah. if you if you go uh, turn up and uh, at work with your client and you forgot your scissors you always have like some some kid in there this is where my brain goes <laughs> interesting okay let's have another break cool hey. Bruno's podcast. so we're back to our uh, third part this is the fun part why is this fun part? Uh, well, basically. Oh, uh, well, we're really going down the fun way. Oh, hello. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you chose it that way around. <laughs> now you have to say things like Hulk smash. Do what? Yeah, say Hulk smash. Hulk smash. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god, it's hard. Kind of cool though. <laughs> it's cool, but it's so hard. I'm like, and I tried to kind of be be serious with this. Um, here you go, here you go. We back. Um, we haven't talked about your tattoo journey, man. Like, this is uh, tattoos. You had these like already. How many years? You haven't got any new ones. Have you got any new ones? Are you gonna get more? Or it's like, what is the deal there? Yeah. So I started actually shortly after I came to London. I had my first tattoo and. Mm. Uh, was only really gonna have one little tattoo. Of course. <laughs> and it just so happened that the guy that I went to was this absolutely amazing kind of pioneering tattooist who kind of was doing a lot of tribal work, back, which back then was kind of unknown. Um, and suddenly I just started booking appointments and we just did more and more and more. But I think it works well because it's one person planning the whole thing. Mm. I mean, we never planned the whole body, but it was like, you know, when one person does the work, it ties together. And I think the styles as well, when people have different styles yeah. on their, it's yeah. like, yeah, it's cool. I've seen, I've seen somewhere like they have like little ones all over the place. Yeah. It kind of works. Sometimes I, I'm not really sure because also like yeah. you can't put it on and like, ah, I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> Can we do this? Yeah. You know? I mean, I'm not, a, I'm personally not a fan of that kind of tattoo where it's nothing kind of ties together. But again, back to the, what makes you feel good. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. If it, as long as it's done well, then tattoos are great. But it's when you see a badly done tattoo. Yeah, yeah. because for, for you at the time when you start getting this tattoo all over your body, that yeah. was quite different. Like you wouldn't see oh, many very people. Much so. yeah. In fact, I remember being out and about on the gay scene in London. There was me and one other guy <laughs> who yeah. were covered in tattoos, and yeah. it, you know it was surprising then. Like now, it's you know. Everybody has tattoos. Yeah. You know. and it's, but it's I still love my tattoos. You know, I I absolutely wouldn't change a thing about mm -hmm. them. Um, I do want to do more. There's bits like this bit of my knee really bothers me. Mm. <laughs> um, and I would like to get some work done on my throat and my hands. Mm. Uh, but the last thing I had tattooed was actually my leg that I had amputated. Mm. Um, and I needed to do something on it just to feel like I was reclaiming it, even though I hated my leg. Mm. Uh, so I had some work done on that and actually it was some of my favorite work <laughs> um, and then obviously it's in the bin somewhere now yeah uh, but that was the last thing I got tattooed uh, I, I have this really weird thing I want to ask you if you don't want to answer don't answer or whatever but it won't be the weirdest question I've ever what asked. happened with your foot I, do you know you're not the first person to ask that <laughs> where is it uh, yeah um, so it's weird on the morning of the operation um, the registrar kind of tech talks you through what's going to happen and she was explaining and then the first thing she said to me when before i asked questions was um no you can't have it because apparently people do ask for uh, the leg um it it goes in an incinerator oh, okay um i'm still kicking myself to this day that i didn't ask for a photograph i wish i had Just asked a for a photo photograph of the, of the leg amputated mm. just i would love to have it mm. i hated that leg so much because it's it literally part been... of you <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> but i think it would have just been nice to have that image yeah. of the thing that i absolutely hated 
Mm. Um, so I'm really sad that I don't have that. But yeah, it, it ends up in an incinerator. Yeah, I'm curious. Like, what is the what is the uh, intention or what is the uh, kind of a uh, idea behind it? Why people can't le- keep their body parts and like, uh, I would I would think that again. You know, if that would happen with me, I would like you know just obviously take the meat stuff or but just have a bone and stuff. I don't know, yeah. make create some kind of a some kind of a a vase. I don't know, I know. something I like. Know. So why There's would they? So many cool things. And she um, didn't try to explain you why. Didn't? She didn't. Um, I mean, I think the the term they always use oh, is biohazard. You know, there's the chance of you know it could be infect. There could be infections. Or I mean, it's whatever. They don't. I mean, they have to have a blanket term. I mean, I do know people that have successfully got their limbs and had like, really? you know, little burial sessions for it um but not in this country in america yeah, yeah, yeah. uh i mean it's kind of weird to have the right taken away yeah um like i said i didn't really want it yeah, anyway, yeah, but yeah. i do wish i had that photo right that's interesting it would have been so cool it's interesting like how they yeah <laughs> it was like just being in that, what is that uh, liquid where they keep? Uh, so they yeah, can keep formaldehyde. Yeah, formaldehyde. Yeah, 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 you have this like yeah, floating. Yeah, yeah. I know it would be so cool, <laughs> wouldn't it? It would be so cool. <laughs> Some people have the lava, lavas. Uh, was that lava vase? Yeah. Or what they yeah, call yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you have this foot just floating. In. <laughs> so I do have. Um, I managed to get the X-rays from the night of the accident. Mm. That's really nice. I've got so I have those. Um, and every so often I pull them out and realize just how smashed up my leg was. Oh God! Uh, so it's nice to have some of those things, but yeah, I don't. What I, is? Uh, I didn't ask this, but what was exactly was damaged in your foot? Is it easy to explain, uh, or there well, was just so many things? There were so messed. many things. Yeah. So from my knee down was completely smashed up. Weirdly, the first smash was at the perfect length for amputation. There is a perfect length. This is calculated. Yeah. Um, if it's the right length, it's easiest to get a prosthetic on. And that was where the first bit of damage was. So, in fact, it worked quite well for me. Mm. But beyond, beyond that, um, the bone had come through my leg. My ankle was smashed to pieces. Uh, when they reconstructed my leg, my leg was shorter. They fixed the ankle. Um, so I had no ankle joint left. Like mm. They removed the ankle joint, screwed my foot onto the bottom of my leg. My foot was at a weird angle, so I didn't have to wear special shoes. I remember, <laughs> I mean, this it's weird how your brain works, but I was determined that I didn't want to have to have special shoes made. You know, like with one sole thin and one yeah, sole yeah, thin. Yeah, yeah. So they attached my foot at an angle so I could wear a heel raise inside a normal shoe, uh, but I wouldn't need special shoes making. But that made it kind of harder to walk on as well. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, it was pretty smashed to pieces. In fact, they... They told me years later that they had bets in the operating room whether they were able to save it or not. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Weird doctors. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I like I, I like hearing that. I like all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I like no. it. yeah. I'm, when I, I say, I'm glad that when I say like we weird, had to the uh, um, uh, the relationship that he was able to tell me that. Yeah. When I when I say weird, I, I, it's positive. Yeah. Because I yeah, like yeah. weird stuff. Yeah. It's, me too. it's all about me that. Me too. And and also like the the all the surgeries were covered by NHS right or, absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah can you imagine if you've been in states <laughs> the first thing you would do like ah, okay yeah I know <laughs> I know I'm very very lucky to be uh, here you know even when it comes down to the prosthetic you know I there's a liner that goes inside that attaches that goes on my leg that holds my prosthetic on mm. and I go through about four a year which is a lot um, mm. and in America you have to apply to your insurance company. You get a new one, they may not give you it, blah, blah, blah. And most people get one a year. So f- I can just pick up the phone wow. and I leave a message, it arrives in the post. Shout out know. to NHS. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean, I have nothing but praise for the NHS. Yeah. Yeah. I've had such a great experience. I know it's not the case for everybody, but, you know, they've, yeah, the service we get in this country mm. is incredible. Um. When I watched uh, this one little interview, there was uh, something when you mentioned it was interesting about the the dating life, the dating life, and how, and it was I, I thought it was kind of kind of peculiar, interesting when uh, you mentioned that you actually didn't say to your date that you you, you did, that you have um, that you disabled that you, <laughs> um, and then then you come up and then what was their reaction? And it's like, and, so so this is pre amputation. Yeah. So it was. Oh, there was pre-amputation. This, that was that was pre-amputation. So you know, it was when I took my shoe off, 
and I was walking around, it was really obvious that there was something going on with yeah, my leg, yeah. you know. Um, you know, and it's, um, I, even though I needed a walking stick to walk, when I went out, I would not take my walking stick. Mm. I hated it. So it was kind of, it wasn't necessarily obvious at first, but I knew when I went home with somebody that they were going to know. Mm. Um, now, um, I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's not meant to sound, it, it is a bit sad, but I haven't dated at all since the amputation. You haven't dated no. at all since But then. also, it's not such a problem now because I never have my prosthetic covered up. My prosthetic is always on the show, so I don't need to have that discussion with yeah. anybody. Um, if I mean, I, I, I do have a thing on one of the apps, um, even though I don't really use it. And initially, I didn't have on there that I was an amputee. And then I thought, this is ridiculous. So now mm. all the pictures show that I'm an amputee. Mm. Um, but yeah, I kind of, yeah, I just, I've been busy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been busy. Because yeah. I, I could just imagine like your profile photo, you just standing there with a blinky on your, on your light. Like, ah, that's cool. Yeah. And it's it's, just I like, mean, I get it's not for everybody, but there's also this weird thing about fetishists. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, so it's like you never know if somebody's interested because they're, into amputees it's quite a big thing it's, uh, so yeah and like I said I've just been busy and I think you get out of the routine and after a while you kind of mm. it doesn't don't even really notice care. anymore like exactly. yeah. yeah and I don't really like the whole idea of dating you know it's uh, when I used to do that stuff it would be I'd go out clubbing I'd meet somebody and mm. I'd go home with them and I'd be with them for a few years mm. and then you split up, you go back out clubbing again, you meet somebody, that's how you... Yeah, yeah. I don't understand this whole dating thing. That, you, you're talking about apps. That's what yeah, you don't yeah, understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, the, the app thing is very weird now. Like, it's, it's like, if I do match with some whatever, I usually say, like, okay, before we actually meet up, let's do a FaceTime, like, yeah. on yeah, WhatsApp, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Because very often it's just a waste of time. You go and meet that yeah. person, you're like, what the hell are we doing Yeah, that's, here? I mean, that's a really good idea, actually. Yeah. <laughs> you should, uh, you should uh, use that. Yeah. And that's a uh, way save, uh, saves time on both sides. A 100%. True. Uh, you know? Um, yeah, dating scene. That's interesting. Like that's both, weird. Both of us in the same, a very similar boat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like I say, it's, I think you get past the point and it's like, yeah. you just don't think about it anymore. I mean, occasionally, I think there's like times I think oh, it'd be nice to be sharing this moment with mm. somebody, but then like the moment passes and it's like, yeah, no, I'm glad I'm on my own. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, if it was right now, amazing, <laughs> but like in five minutes' time, go. <laughs> nice one. So I was asking you about your three favorite books, three favorite films, and mm. three favorite people. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. books, you were like, I don't yeah, really this, read yeah. books, and you gave me this one book. Yeah. Do you? What was the last time you read it, or when? When did you? I read mean, it? I I read that quite a long time. I I read occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, I find reading difficult because I have so many conversations going on in my head. Yeah, and I can't stop them. So oh. it's like I get to the end of a page and it's like I have no idea what I've just read because really? I've been thinking about this, about that. So I just find it hard work. So it's just not my favorite. Thing yeah, to yeah, do. yeah. Uh, but occasionally you're given a book and it absolutely. Mm. Um, have you ever tried to get into audiobooks? Because that's what I'm doing. I, I have done all, actually a lot of time in hospital mm. spent listening to audiobooks, but I think I have an association with being sick or oh. being, you know, yeah. recovering from an operation in an audiobook. So I kind of like, yeah, I don't enjoy that. Anyway, so the book you suggested was The Ex Exquisite Corpse. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I actually it's listened, dark. I listened oh, to my, it. When, if you look, <laughs> when we talk about all of these choices... I mean, there's a lot of darkness in there. Yeah, yeah, but like this book specifically was the most graphic book about genitals and. <laughs> so well, I no, ever... it's, it's about a gay serial killer. It's about yeah, 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 yeah. It's about uh, yeah. It's no, got, no, no, it's but, got a bit of everything. No, but what there. I'm saying is like I but, never heard anything so so graphic, and it was interesting. It was like they also it was portrayed, it was written, it was uh, yeah. It's it's a powerful book, but also it's a. It's a beautiful read. Mm. It's a beautiful read. And, you know, there's a love story that goes on in there as yeah. well. Um, I just think it's 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 just it's powerful. And yeah, it, and it's, it's stayed with me for years. And, and it years covers and years. so many so many different aspects as well. Absolutely. Like what is the relationship? What is that 
what does it mean for everyone is different and um and also like how you know the how uh for gay people was like to fight like getting out and and opening the closets and fighting with all that stuff so it's yeah. oh it's it's interesting it's it's where it's one of those books that gay men of a certain age a lot of them will have read it i think mm -hmm. it was quite groundbreaking at the time um and it still is fantastic read i'd recommend i mean you've got if you like dark stories yeah with a bit of romance in there as well. Mm. You know, it's a, it's a fantastic read. Good stuff. No, I enjoyed it. I'm right. still still listening and haven't fi finished it. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> and that's that's why the, that's the idea about like when I have guests, I always ask about them because then it's great to also discuss certain things uh, that we both seen on, or read or whatever. Yeah. So you you have different take that I have, and then just Absolutely. to hear each each uh, both sides. Yeah. Cool. Okay, and then we have films. Uh, Blade Runner, absolute uh, classic. Yeah, I mean, I I can't imagine anybody not liking that movie. Mm. I think it was visually, I think the story's amazing, the concept, everything. It just, mm. it doesn't date either. You watch it now, yeah. it still looks as fresh as the day it was made. And even though it wasn't a great hit at the time, mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's gained this appreciation over the years. But I kind of saw the, you know, they made the second one, yeah, which was powerful, but not. It didn't, mm -hmm. it didn't do it for me. It's how all. interesting it is with those sequels. It like. felt like it tried a bit too hard. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, that movie is amazing. Absolutely the only, the only movie, honestly, like the only movie I think the second was better than the first was Terminator Two. Okay. Like honestly, yeah. had, that that's the. But again, I mean, well, saying that actually, we're we're coming up to. Another movie, which actually the second one was great, which is Alien. Mm, yeah, um, true. I mean, Alien true. is incredible, but Alien Two was also. Yeah, incredible. I was just in general, I was not a very huge fan of the. When Alien came out, I was actually um, traumatized from horror films. Okay. Yeah, okay. and like I couldn't watch. Tra uh, yeah, no, I'm a bit of a horror fan. Horror films till I was age of literally like nineteen, twenty. Okay. Yeah, because I was so traumatized. My father allowed me to watch when I was like seven or six years old. Okay. And I get so traumatized. There's one, uh, one uh, uh, horror film was about these. Uh, demons uh who live under the bed of the these kids and like these bloody hands come out and just pull the child under the bed <laughs> and not kidding you for like three four years i couldn't sit on the side on the yeah, edge I of can, my bed I, I can relate to that i yeah. mean that's yeah it's i like, mean i remember i mean i don't know how this ever happened but i remember going to see jaws mm. in the cinema with my parents well jaws came out in the 70s yeah i was born in the 70s mm. so i there was no way i was even 10 years old when that mm. movie came out so i think i was probably like seven and, your and parents we were allowed to take think about that yeah exactly we went because they didn't have the pg or whatever that's called like they don't have the yeah, age I don't, limitation I, yeah I don't, I don't know how it happened anyway so i mean, maybe that started my um love of horror movies mm -hmm. but very much of horror movies of that era uh, i think a lot of modern horror movies the special effects are too computer generated mm. um thing with uh alien and the thing, mm. um, I think they're two of the last great horror movies that used, you know, real in-person yeah. um, effects rather than computer work being added on afterwards. I mean, Alien, when you see the suit of the monster, I mean, when you see it in real life, it's not that great. Mm -hmm. on the, you know, it's essentially somebody in a suit, you know, and it was amazing. And the thing, you know, all the models were made out of, you know, wax and, you know, it's, it was real things that were happening. Um, yeah, the puppets or what, yeah, what is yeah. it? Yeah, even prosthetics of yeah, the kind of yeah, setups. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's incredible to see those movies. I think if those movies were made now, they wouldn't have the same impact. The alien, probably the craziest, was the sound what the alien was making. Yeah, yeah, It's incredible. It's absolutely so cool. incredible. Uh, uh, but I was scared shitless, especially in an alien when they... Uh, this thing came out of the stomach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god, that scene! Yeah. Like I always just start thinking about, woo, look yeah, at this, yeah. and just runs out, runs away. It's interesting. It I saw a, a, a thing about the making of that movie, and the actors that were stood around John Hurt when that happened had not been told what was going to happen. <gasps> no, no, that scene is insane. Yeah. So yeah, like he was kind of like part of his body was under, and then on top of it was like this prosthetic thing, yeah. and then just this thing just jumps yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the reaction on their faces is it's real. the actual reaction. Yeah. I like when they do this in movies. Um, do you know the um, uh, 
Breaking Breaking Bad. No, not Breaking Bad. Uh, with Bruce Willis. What is it called? Uh, uh, the Christmas movies. Die Hard. Die Hard, sorry. Yeah. So Die Hard. Is it really bad? I've never seen Die Hard. <laughs> you haven't seen <laughs> no, it? I've never oh, seen Die Hard. How dare you? Yeah, yeah. Um, in Die Hard, there's a scene where what, this actor wasn't told that he's going to be let go. He has to do the falling scene where he does like this reaction. And it's the, the Gruber, this German, like the evil guy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and they didn't tell him that they're going to let him go. And they did it. And it was just like actual genuine reaction yeah. in his face. Yeah. And you can see it just worked perfectly. Yeah. Sometimes you just need to do that, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Okay, so you're a fan of uh, all the scary stuff. Um, yeah. I like scary, moody stuff. You scary know? Moody. I want to be, when I go to the cinema, I want to be transported into another world. Mm. Like, you know, I love m movies like the, uh, in the modern time or, you know, kind of tell a story, whatever, but I don't really want to see those movies in the cinema. Mm. If I go to the cinema, I want to be transported somewhere else. What about Avatar? Did you watch that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I went at like three o'clock in the morning to the IMAX cinema to watch that. Yeah. You know, Did you see I the second one as well? Fully. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I want a full experience of those Is movies. it bad that I haven't seen the second one yet? <laughs> um, I mean, it's an hour too long. Yeah. They could take an hour out of it and it would still be a great movie, but it's just three hours. It's just too much. Yeah, it's just too a little much. bit too much. Uh, and then we have people. Hmm. So Kate Bush. Yeah, I kind of, um, music was very important to me at, when I was younger. And uh, I was introduced to Kate Bush via my sister, who was, I think she's about four years older than me. And I always remember uh, sitting in the back of the car, my sister would have a little cassette player mm. and she'd be playing Kate Bush. And it just was this incredible music. So it represents a period in my life as well. Um, but yeah, I've been obsessed with Kate Bush ever since. I probably listen to Kate Bush most days. And I got to see her in concert when she did a concert recently. Um, and her work is incredible. Her storytelling, the videos that go along with them. I just think it's just, she's remarkable. She's, you know. She's and music in general is just huge. For me, like probably one of the most kind of, it, it, if I listen to that song or some of those songs from that album, I get all of a sudden transported in this time machine capsule. Like I remember uh, there was certain um, Coldplay songs, which I was listening when I just moved to big city. I lived in student dormitories yeah. infested by cockroaches, yeah. but I was the happiest person ever because I'm finally out of the house. I'm surrounded by all these like cool people. And then now anytime I would hear some of those old Coldplay songs, I'm like, oh my God, I'm there. It's the music. Is... Music is incredible. Um, but I love music that, properly tells a story mm. i find a lot of new music um certainly chart music a little bit challenging because it's oh just... what like ella ella eh, eh, exactly. eh, eh. it's yeah. beautiful it's such a big story yeah. come on yeah. it's about yeah. umbrella that yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? so occasionally i discover new artists yeah. at the moment but very few and far between that really yeah. get i want to feel a reaction to a song not 100%. just like oh god 100 it's crazy how yeah we are going backwards in so many ways. And uh, yesterday I almost posted this on my Instagram. I saw uh, someone did it like as a reel that to, uh, like today's one of these girls, famous singers, whatever. It's just something smack it, smack it, pussy, lips, lips. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I mean, what look, the let's, hell? There's, what ass pussy? I mean, what the hell was that about? <laughs> I mean, we know what it was about, but it was like, how is that such a big hit? Is it? Do you think it's just humans are getting stupid? What is what is going on? I don't, I, I really How does don't that know. work? I, I really don't know. I don't know. And also, it's like it's back in the days. Uh, poetry was considered to be a thing. When someone reads poetry, they consider to be cool people. They consider yeah. to be to intelligence. It had yeah. a some kind of. Um, uh, value to it nowadays. If you just say someone, well, I read poetry, yeah. like, oh, what's yeah. wrong with you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Why don't you do a TikTok video? Uh, uh. <laughs> Uh, Grace Jones. Yeah, so um, Grace Jones, I, again, I loved her music, but it was her visual. Mm. You know, just this, so artistic in the way that she presents herself, so androgynous, so powerful. Um, I just was hooked from the minute I mm. first saw her. Um, and again, I still listen to her music. I mean, that's... I know it's not quite as meaningful as Kate Bush, and you know mm. I know it's like more on the disco-y side, but it still has some depth to it. Um, and but the artistic side of Grace Jones, I think, is incredible. Yeah. And, you know, she's she's still 
doing gigs now. In fact, I went to see her at the festival hall last year, the year before. She was amazing, mm. absolutely amazing. What a performer! Amazing costumes. I was, yeah, I think she's very underrated. Yeah, yeah and it's, you see, as long as it makes sense to you, you know, it doesn't matter how how it works for anyone else. As long as that speaks to you, yeah. as long as that influences you. I got to, so I was sat next to her once on a flight. Really, um, I was doing some work out in New York, and I was lucky enough to be flying first. And uh, the the plane was seemed to be delayed. Mm. It was like nobody really knew what was going on. And I remember this: the rim of a hat appeared in the doorway, like minutes before the actual person that was wearing it. This hat was enormous and kind of like coming down, draped down over the head. And immediately, I just knew it was her. I knew oh, it was her. No. And, uh, she came in, yeah, she was sat next to me, and it was quite an experience. Uh, so did you get a chat? Um, I did chat to her, but I was like, I was, you know when you just like, <laughs> <laughs> be careful, Andrew, be careful. <laughs> I was like, I didn't want to I love you. quite how excited I was. Um, but yeah, that was that was a great experience. I mean, yeah. you're just sitting next to somebody, but you know, it's just when you're idle, it's sat next to you. It's kind of... But yeah, so what What amazing. do you talk about? Like, I've, I've been fortunate enough, like, working in the film industry, you know, working with big, big stars like uh, Ryan Reynolds, like mm. uh, Samuel Lee Jackson, like Dwayne Johnson, The Rock and all those. But very early in my head, I realized there's not much I can t say to them what they haven't heard. Yeah. If I would just say to them, huge fan of you, yeah. what impact does that leave yeah, yeah. i'm just one of the other thousand million people who is huge fan of me yeah. and then i would just come up with some weird things to talk about yeah uh, well i kind of i i thought carefully before i spoke to her <laughs> and uh i'd seen her in concert fairly recently and she does this whole sequence where she hula hoops for like eight minutes through the whole of a song and she, as she's moving around stage it's, mm -hmm. it's incredible so I talked to her about hula hooping, like, you know, where did you learn, you know, how was, was that something you did just for the concert? Or, and mm -hmm. actually it was an interesting conversation for her, because, yeah. you know, she started talking about it, came from her childhood. Mm. You know? um, so it was a nice conversation to have without being like, yes, too, exactly, nailed exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I've worked with quite a lot of celebrities, yeah, quite imagine, wise, yeah. so I'm kind of used to being able to just have a conversation rather yeah. than being... <laughs> <laughs> I'm your biggest fan. Because um, you're probably not. <laughs> yeah. And it is, but people do think, oh, I really want to meet and have a conversation with this person. Actually, most people have got nothing to say exactly. to them. It's like, exactly. And it's just, they live an ordinary life like all of us. They yeah. just do very visual, you know, high profile things. So it's nice to talk to people on that level. Mm. You know, well, what did you have for dinner last night? Exactly. You know. Yeah, that's the beauty. And you see, like, we, we almost like this is our experience a little bit here as well. Like when I met you, when we, you know, we used to come to train and stuff. And like since then, your path has been so different and so many things going on. But all I care is about like, oh, t how was your experience? How did that feel? How yeah. was that do yeah, yeah. doing that balloon stuff? Yeah. That? Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's interesting how we just kind of somehow coded that someone is getting more famous, more than it's all of a sudden they're different. Yeah. You know, yeah. they need to deal on a daily basis with more bullshit. That's true, but... So I have this slightly weird thing. I'm still getting used to it. Um, the poll community is not massive, mm -hmm. and I have quite... A, you know, I have a reasonable Instagram following, and that Instagram following is all over the world. So, you know, I'll go to do um, a competition, or I'll go and train in another country when I'm travelling, and I can guarantee somebody will lose their shit when I walk in. It's oh, wow. so weird. It's so weird, but they won't come and talk to me straight away. Yeah. And then, like, you know, maybe an hour later, they'll come up and they'll finally talk to me. Oh, my God. I'm just, like, well, just, just come and say hi. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you know. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, and so for celebrities, that's amplified, you know, a yeah. hundred million times. Yeah. Well, for me, like, uh, the biggest one was the Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. So mm -hmm. he would be right next to me, like, with the, the film, the Hobbs and Shaw. And I would lose my shit if I was still next to Dwayne I, I was like, I, I was literally had a script in my head what I'm going to say and then when I actually came over all I said it was something huge fun <laughs> that's it and I'm like he's like oh, oh yeah, it's okay brother <laughs> so stupid because like I had this thing like I had a friend of mine who was actually going through cancer and I thought like it would be sick to do like a little video like mm. to say to him like you know get better soon whatever 
And uh, I just, I didn't have enough nerve to ask him that. <laughs> um, but yeah. Oh, well, and uh, one more person we have, Quentin Crisp. Yeah, so, I mean, he's a slightly divisive character. First of all, I, the thing about Quentin Crisp is I, when I was in my much younger days, I saw a movie called The Naked Civil Servant, which is his kind of um, story. Uh, and, you know, he lived in a very difficult era, being gay, being very flamboyant. Um, and it kind of like tells a lot of his stories, which is, you know, I think that's the thing. His, his visual was so incredible in a day that was not accepting. Mm. You know? uh, so it's, you know, it's a very hard life that he lived, although he was also incredibly fabulous as well. Um, it's divisive because he kind of like also has, um, he doesn't really, he didn't really believe in gay liberation. Um, he made some comments about AIDS being a fad and, you know, he's kind of, he, he, he said some controversial things, um, but still he was a pioneer in many mm. ways. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think he just had such a big impact on me when I saw that film um, when I was fairly young. What was the title of the film? The Naked Civil Servant. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was an incredible character. And I think a lot of, I know younger gay people should kind of maybe look back in history mm. about, you know, people that paved the way paved for the it way, to yeah. be okay these days, you know, and yeah. the struggle that a lot of people had. I mean, I don't expect every person t to look at their history. And, you know, some people mm. just aren't interested, but an awareness of how difficult it was to get to the point where we're at now, um, I think mm. it's important. And, you know, Quentin Crisp is a very good example of that. You see, again, one of these reasons, like, why I ask what people who influence you in your life, it's... Mm. It's so, you know, we are, we have to be so grateful and so <sighs> thankful that we have those people and we can find some something like what, uh, because through them we can experience certain things, we can understand certain things. And, Absolutely. And, and the mentorship is just so important. And um, I, th I think, like, in my high school, I was just really struggling, like, that we didn't have, like, mentors, teachers mm -hmm. who would be, like, being not just a teacher who is here to give you a subject, but also, like, mentoring you. Yes, you can do that, or you can do that no matter what. And and it's great that if we can't find it in a, in a school, we can find, like, I will find, like, Arnie or, or Bruce Lee yeah. or, like, those yeah. different kind of characters. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, like when someone would ask me, like, I don't even, I can't even say so straight away. Three people I think are really like great inspirations to me. Hmm. Um, yeah. Oh, anyways, listen, this is fantastic. Yeah, it's been great, Renaz. Man, I'm, I can't express my, I'm so thank, thankful that you came all the way from all the way where you are. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's not that far, but yeah. I, you know. But it's, still, uh, it's a and pleasure to do. Finally, find the time. And uh, the last thing I usually ask for my guests is like, uh, I call it a, a bomb of wisdom. You already were giving me a lot of bombs of wisdoms here. But uh, what would oh, you suggest? Weirdly, I've got one in my head, and it's because we were talking about school. Yeah. Something popped up on my Instagram um, okay. in the last couple of days. You know, our schools are about to go back to school. And all it was saying was parents, spend five minutes with your kids before they go back to school and just say to them, you know, don't judge people, don't pick on people for being different. And you know, if we start telling our kids that at school age, it's gonna improve everybody's life. And it's gonna help with um, sexuality, gender, disability, looking different, race, all those issues. If we can just tell our kids, look, mm. this Beautiful. is fine. You know, different is not bad. Mm. Um, yeah, so, and, you know, as our schools are just about to go back, parents tell your kids, you know, because their kids are going to be adults and we don't want those adults to be beating up the people that are different. Hallelujah, brother. Yeah. I totally agree, and that's that's a beautiful bomb of wisdom, and thank you so much again for coming ah, over. Such pleasure on us. Bosh! And a little dance before we leave. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> are and you ready? Paid for this. It's about to jump. It's about to drop. Come on, yeah. Oh, where are my glasses? Uh-oh. Here we go. Here we go. That's it. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Bruno's Podcast.